My son was um, a very happy boy. He was ADHD bipolar. So throughout his life, he had a lot of difficulties communicating with people, behavior issues, but he was still that loving, good child. He struggled his whole life. Um, he would always say he would see spirits, voices, and a few times um, he did wrong stuff and he would say the voices would tell him to. And I'm talking about when he was like eight years old. And as years went by, um, he continued to be followed by these spirits. He would wake up and screaming like, Mom, I just dream about the bone lady. I just dream about the devil, like stuff like that. And he was, I remember he was in fourth grade and he would sleep with holy water around his room that he would ask his grandma to give him. That's what he would actually ask his grandma for. Get me holy oil, get me holy water, and crucifix in his hand. He would sleep with them wrapped in his hand. I remember I would wake up and go check on him, and he would have them in his uh, hand wrapped. And um, I would tell his doctor, like, it hurts me to see him go through this. Like, if we, t we are terrified after having a ni nightmare, I can't imagine a child dreaming this stuff every night. Everything he was seeing, it was because of his mental illness. And it was just so tough throughout the years as he was growing, learning how to deal with all this. And this is one of the main reasons that he, he led to misbehaving, doing stuff that he would always say, Mom, I don't want to do this, but these voices don't leave me alone. So it was pretty hard. I had a tough time um, understanding his mental illness. And around 10 years old, he was run over by a vehicle. And um, he was in coma for four days. He asked to go to his grandma's house. I let him go. And his grandma lived two houses down, which it was okay for, me, for, him, for him to go. On his way over there, he bumps into a friend. And the friend tells him, look, my dad bought me this bike. And he was 10 years old, chubby, and the bike was an adult size bike. And my son um, asked, like, hey, let me try it. Let me ride it. And um, the little boy said, yes, my son got on it. And my son still not knowing that that bike is the bikes that you have to break from the front, not from the pedals. So as my son saw the van coming, and him not knowing how to use the bike, he it it just he just I remember he said he just kept going back and the van just rushed him and ran over him, and she was going 40 miles an hour. So it was a very traumatic. Um, besides his illness, to now go through that trauma in his head, he always said the headaches were were very bad and I, his neurologist told me that since the trauma was so so strong there was a lot of bruising and um, blood clots that since he was 10 they would diminish within time because he was young but they would cause headaches. As he got older he started hanging out with other kids with different influences and I later found out that he was doing um, smoking wheat. And of course, I never approved it. And um, uh, he was um, caught with, with the wheat in school. And um, little problems like that, like an adolescent normally 
goes through. And um, those started being issues in the family with him. And um, I remember I told him I wasn't going to allow it here at the house and that he had to stop. And um, he would tell me, Mom, it helps me, Mom. It helps me with the ADHD. It calms me down. And I remember at one point, even one of his doctors told me, it's better for him to smoke this week than all these drugs, the psychotic medication that we have to prescribe him. I want to say around freshman time, he entered high school, and I started noticing a difference in his personality. And um, and I would see um, his behavior a little bit different. And um, I found out he was consuming Xanax. I did my investigation. Like, what was it? I asked him, and I would tell him, and and he would tell me that I was wrong, that he wasn't doing it, that he would never consume that, that he was not stupid to consume that type of drug. So it went like that. I believe my son. And um, I later, later, I want to say, like, in the midst of his freshman year, um, he had some friends over. And I saw those boys, like, different. Like, I knew they were in drugs. And that's when I started suspicion, asking questions like, are you all on pills? Like, are you all doing some type of other drug? I remember even calling the moms, like, come pick up your kids. Like, there's something different. I struggled with my son, like behavior issues, but never for, I never forget that he was that sweet boy that would always go in my room. What you doing, mom? Let's go buy munchies, mom. Mom, let's watch a Netflix. Like he was always the one, the sweet one with me, with his brothers, always teasing them and making them laugh and, boxing with his brother and playing football outside, basketball. And um, he was like, like the spark in our family. My son um, ended up leaving uh, with two boys. At the, they were the age of 17 and 16. And um, he left with them on the car, and these boys had drugs, and they were stopped by a cop for a, a light. One of their lights was not working in their car. And since my son was 16, they told my son to take the blame. And um, so they don't go to jail. So my son takes the whole blame and they put him in juvenile for that charge. It was a scale. I remember they had a scale and I don't know what else. And um, he was um, in juvenile for two months and a half. And um, he was released on a Friday. Saturday, he spent it with his dad. And Sunday, he was returned back to me. And I remember that day, he's like, Mom, Let's go to church. Wake up. Let's go to church. I got to thank the Lord that he freed me. And I was like, okay, babe. I remember I got ready. And um, we went to church. And mind that he usually always sat behind me. So I don't see him texting. That day he sat next to me. And I remember throughout the worshiping, he was worshiping, he was clapping, and I was just full of tears. Like, wow, like my son, mine, that when he was in juvie, he would tell me, Mom, God touched me, Mom. When I get released, I'm going to tell you everything God, God showed me here, Mom. And it made me feel like, wow, my son is connecting with God. And that throughout that time, I remember I would say, like, 
wow, like God is working with him. And because before he was in Joey, we, we usually go to church. Like we already had an ear going to church. So he already knew about God. And I remember a few times he would tell me, mom, do you talk to the pastor, mom? Because everything he says falls on me. And I'm like, no, <laughs> it's the Lord talking to you. And okay, well, we go back to that day. Um, he was um, praising the Lord. And I remember I was in tears and he would tap my knee and tell me, mom, stop crying. I'm like, babe, I can't stop crying. Like, I, I'm just seeing you. And and then he would continue and throughout the preaching, like he was like ruined to the to the preaching and church ended. And um he's like, Hey mom, you bust me out a cookout today? Man, mom, I feel like eating some cookout, like in Spanish, like I want a carne sasso. And I was like, Yes, like we'll we'll do it. And um, we got home, we turned up the the we, the wings, we we're gonna do wings. And um, he asked me, mom, can a friend come over, mom? So I'm not alone. And I was like, oh, Jay, we're not allowed to have nobody over. And he's like, man, mom, it's just you and, and Rick, like, I'm alone. His other brothers and sisters were with his dad. And then um, I was like, all right, I'll let you, I'll let you have them over. But your sister's gonna go pick them up so we wouldn't, we know where he lives and drop them off. He's like, all right, all right. So they went, I stayed here getting the wings ready, marinating them and they get back and he brings him to the kitchen. He's like, hey, mom, this is my friend. And I was like, oh, hi, nice to meet you. I was like, I don't want no drugs in here. JJ's not allowed to be in drugs. And he answers me in Spanish. No, ma'am, I don't want nothing to do with drugs either. And they, I was like, okay, I'll let y'all know when the food's ready. And they turn around and walk. I remember observing and walking away. And I get the pot with the wings and I walk outside. And I want to say within like five minutes that I started there handing wings and stuff, my phone rings. And I look at it and it was my daughter. And I, I the first call, I just look at it since my hands were all dirty with season, I didn't answer. And she calls again. And I was like, she was just here. So I answer the second call and she tells me, mom, mom, the boy that's in JJ's room just called me and told me JJ ain't waking up. So I was like, what? They just went in the room. So I dropped what I'm doing and I ran in his room and I find him in the bed unconscious. So I start screaming at the boy like, what did you give my son? What did you give my son? And he tells me, I didn't give him nothing. I didn't give him nothing. And he kept on holding his head and like throwing himself like on the floor. And I, and I start screaming and I start, JJ. I open his eyelid and I saw his eyeballs like back. So um, I call 911 right away. Um, I got that sense. And um, I check his pulse as I'm calling and I feel the pulse. So I calmed down. I was like, I could feel a pulse. And the 911 caller tells me um, if he had a pulse, I said, yes. He's like, okay, lay him down and open his airway. And the boy actually helped me pull him down because he was like sitting on the headboard. So we lay him down and open his airway. And she's like, okay, check his pulse again. And I check his pulse again. And there was no pulse. There was no pause, but I hear my son going, like making some gurgle sounds. And I'm talking to him and she's like, start CPR, start CPR. And I started CPR. And um, within like three to four or five minutes, the ambulance gets to the house and um, they rush in the room and um, they continue to do the CPR. 
but the CPR was getting done in the mattress. It was not on a hard surface. And I remember I started recording. I was like, I'm gonna show my son everything so he could see what he went through. He went through me thinking that he was gonna be saved and we were gonna be able to show everything. And um, they took him, the ambulance took him and he was pronounced dead in the hospital of fentanyl. They told me he died of fentanyl poisoning. It was a pretty hard moment to have to tell my other kids that their brother was gone. He was only 16. <laughs> so it's been pretty hard. We're going through, I'm going through some hard moments accepting like this boy was not charged for manslaughter, for distributing the drug. Um, unfortunately, the police department didn't take him that night. They didn't interrogate him that night. He even kicked the drugs under the bed and the cop was like, what did you kick under the bed? But he didn't bend over to check. Not until they took the body that my mom started going through the room and lifting up mattress and she finds all the pills under the bed. So his case was very neglected by the police department. He didn't he let him go that day to his house and I believe he should have been interrogated that right I mean he for me he's a suspect. He's the last person with my son. And if he wouldn't have come came home my son wouldn't have consumed that drug. So I do feel like he should have been charged with some type of charge. I mean, the police department told me that since my son consumed it, nobody's forced to consume a drug, that there was not really a charge they could charge him for. And his case was close. And that is one thing that I say and I ask myself, why did he not run and get help? Why did he not call 911? About two months after my son's pass, I got communicated by a family member and they tell me the boy that killed JJ, that was with JJ that night, is in a convenience store outside. And as a mother, and with no justice at all, I rushed to the, to the convenience store. And I see him there, and I ask him, get up. I'm JJ Calderon's mom. His eyes wide open. And I was like, what happened? Why did you not take the drug? Why did I not find you and my son dead? And he just started crying and crying. I was like, you and I know you murdered my son. Why did you call my daughter? I had so many questions. I remember I asked him so many questions and he had no answers. He would just say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And, um, I want to say that's the only closure I've gotten because, I mean, I have not gotten no justice for my son's murder or his case. Like, there's nothing been done. We have my son's room full of all his pictures, his memories, because we want to keep his memory alive, um, respect his, his life at least till we're ready because we ain't ready yet. My kids ain't ready yet. And we have fixed it up, put his posters, banners, memories, pictures, certificates, trophies. We have it all for him in memory of him. Get informed about Narcon. If I would have Narcon that night, 
I would have been able to save my son. If the ambulance or the police department had not come with them, we would have been able to save JJ. Nobody had Narcan. The EMS was doing CPR on a mattress. When you don't do that, you get you get no compression in a mattress. So there was a few stuff done wrong. I mean, we expect the best respond from EMS and police department. And I was failed by both of them. The police officer was a rookie. He just kept on saying it was his first time doing a case like this. He didn't take the boy to get interrogated. He didn't take the drugs. He didn't take the straw. Everything was done wrong. 